My distinguished sister and brother judges and colleagues of the Supreme Court, Sri Vikas Singh, President of the Supreme Court Bar Association, our distinguished Attorney General, Mr. R. Venkatramani, the learned Solicitor General, Mr. Tushar Mehta, Mr. Pradeep Kumar Rai, Mr. Rahul Kaushik, distinguished senior members of the bar, and all the other members of the bar who are present here. I am really deeply grateful to you for organizing this felicitation event on my being appointed as Chief Justice of India. This has a very special significance for me because I commenced my practice as a young member of the bar in the Supreme Court. My father had made an announcement that I will not join the bar and be in active practice so long as he was the Chief Justice of India because he believed that wherever I joined, uh, that court in that sense would be below the Supreme Court in hierarchy which is what led me to three years of graduate education in the US after which I returned. But on my return with an LLM and a PhD, an SJD as they called it at Harvard, I realized how uninitiated I was in the law. When I went to Mumbai, my first brief was given to me by a good friend to mention a matter before Justice Sujata Manohar. Then I asked him, I said, how much should I mark on the docket? Because you have these green dockets where you mark your fees in gold mohars in Mumbai. Each gold mohar is 15 rupees as opposed to Calcutta where I believe it is 16 rupees. I thought I would be given a reasonable fee commensurate with my educational qualifications. But he told me that, well, ordinarily, a junior is paid five guineas for mentioning a matter. In your case, since you are being briefed for the first time by me, you can increase it to six guineas. So I had a fee of, a very, very royal fee of less than 100 rupees to mention a matter. That's where I began from. But I realized when I came to the Supreme Court to practice how uninitiated I was in the law. But I really learned my craft at the feet of the greats of our own bar and on the bench in those days to whom I have an eternal debt of gratitude. One of my first briefs was given to me by Mr. Praveen Parekh from Parekh and Company to appear in a land acquisition matter before Justice M.P. Thakkar. I had not the faintest clue on how to argue a land acquisition matter, no clue about what sale instances are all about, and least of all was I aware of something called the Miriam's tables, which formed the basis. It was like an actuarial table in that case. So Justice Tucker kept the matter the next day and said, don't sleep in the night, but get ready with the brief and come and argue the matter tomorrow. And that became reported as Chimanlal Hargovindas was the state of Gujarat, on the basis of which I got several more matters. People didn't realize that the real credit for that judgment went to the judge and not to the lawyer, the young lawyer who was arguing the matter. So I really learned at the feet of the greats of the bar and the bench. I was briefed with Mr. Fali Nariman in a matter relating to the withdrawal of the prosecution of three chief ministers under section 321 of the CRPC. And that was challenged and eventually referred to the constitution bench. So when the judges were exchanging a conversation between themselves, I was keen to tell the senior on what is the next line of authority to cite. So he put his hand up and said, quiet, he said, quiet. And then he told me, so when the judges speak when a matter is going on, always be silent and see what they are talking about. That will give you an insight on which way the matter is going and what they expect of you. Focus on the court and focus on what the judges are speaking about. Then in numerous conferences, I learned what we have now called, we have come to learn or label as the Nariman list of dates. Every time you had a conference, you would improve upon the list of dates. The dates would be distinguished from your submissions, which would come in the form of a note. There was Lalna and Sinhaji, the then Attorney General, 
was understated brilliance personified. You could barely hear him behind the first row. But when you leant over and tried to follow what he was arguing, you were struck by the sheer brilliance in his simplicity in the manner in which he made his presentation. You recall that he was the attorney general who walked out of the court when Ram and Shaman was being argued, that famous case on tenders. I was in the court when Mr. S. N. Kakkar was arguing a matter in court number four, when a very strong judge, Justice D. A. Desai, was tearing a young junior apart. And Mr. Kakkar was pouring into his briefs, getting ready with his own case. And then suddenly he sprung out of nowhere and said, Milad Zai protest at the manner in which the junior counsel is being dealt with by your lordships. And if I don't raise my voice, I would be unfair to the young juniors for whom I stand today. There was Mr. K. Parasaran. He would spend hours, when he used to argue before the Constitution bench, the court was not, court number one, the chief's court was not as crowded in those days. So we would spend post-lunch sessions on days when Mr. Parasan was arguing a Constitution bench matter and just listen to him expounding for two hours the bare text of the Constitution, not a single authority in hand, but just the Constitution in his hand, arguing from the legislative lists, explaining to the court how the legislative lists had to be balanced. I was once arranging books in the lunch tower in court number one, when the irrepressible Mr. R.K. Garg walked in and gave me a slap on my back and said, what are you doing? Haven't you had your lunch? So I said, I'm arranging the briefs for my senior. He says, that's the problem with you Bombay lawyers. You only focus on efficiency. But where will the vision come from if you only focus on your cases? So look beyond the immediate brief that you are called upon to argue. Then of course you had Mr. Soli Sorabji with whom I appeared in so many different cases. Precision the vision of public law. He led me in D.C. Vadhva versus the state of Bihar, the matter which went to the constitution bench when the Bihar Ordinance Raj was challenged. And it all arose from a book which was written by an economist who was researching land tenures in the state of Bihar. And he found that ordinances were being re-promulgated for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years without being converted into law. And that became the subject matter of a challenge which was really spearheaded by Mr. Sorabji, and that was the brilliant judgment of our court. There was Mr. Ashok Desai, who would talk to you about law, but he had a deep connect between law, life, and literature. I remember as, as a very young lawyer, I had gone to him on a Saturday to brief him. So after the conference was over, he asked me. So he said, young man, what is your poison? And to which I answered in a very ignorant way. So I said, I haven't yet decided to consume any, sir. <laughs> I haven't come to the stage when I have to really look for poison. Only to be told later on that poison meant something very else, something very different in the analogy of, uh, in the analogy of Ashok Bhai. Dr. Jitle, about whom the Attorney General mentioned, Dr. Chitle never left the chamber even after work was over. He had a stipulated time to leave the chamber, which was typically at 10 o'clock in the night. So when the conferences were over, and many of those conferences were occupied by a very young Mr. R. Venkatramani, so very earnest and always on, on punctual time, he would just pick out a book from the library, whether it was the restatement of laws or American jurisprudence or some book on the law but never left until it was 10 o'clock and it was time to reach. And that's how the classical judgment in Central Indian Water Transport Corporation came into being. I was briefed once with Mr. Ashok Sen, and he said that I have no time for a conference, but if you don't mind, will you accompany me to the airport in my car and I'll tell you what to research over the weekend. So between the Supreme Court and Palam, I was occupied by just the sheer brilliance of Mr. Ashok Sen, who through his memory would throw cases at me and say, look, this is the citation, look at these cases, and be ready for me when I come back on Monday morning to argue the matter. So I can really go on endlessly. But I think 
What I am today and what I humbly profess to be is a product of what we have learned from the greats of the bench and the bar. Justice Sabhyasachi Mukherjee, who as a judge of the Calcutta High Court, had the courage to say when the Supreme Court decided to intervene in a matter which he was hearing, that let wiser heads decide, he said. But though he said, let wiser heads decide, it's to the eternal credit of our institution that he was not, his career was not put in the back burner, but he was brought here to become the Chief Justice of India. You had the great Justice A.P. Sen, a little negative in criminal jurisprudence, and I was arguing a very interesting murder appeal before him as a young lawyer. So Justice A.P. Sen would always focus on the injuries more than the evidence. So he said to me, but there is nothing in your case. He said, don't you realize that the intestines came out? So I was so young and perhaps a little impetuous. So I said, my lords, it is because the intestines came out that I'm here before your lordships to argue this appeal. <laughs> Justice P.D. Desai, who became the Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court, a distinguished Chief Justice. Justice P.D. Desai would hold what we call the Desai Darbar every morning in the court, which was really the process by which he tried to mediate in matters involving small people, a young laborer, a widow who is asking for family pension. And his court would be full of litigants in the morning. And he would be spending a few minutes on every case trying to tell the employer or the government to settle that case. So we as young lawyers would just sit in the court and watch him in operation. And we possibly learnt a great deal about the great injustice which pervades our society and what is the plight of common citizens when they come face to face with power and authority of the state. Those were the judges who taught us our intuitive sense of justice and how they dealt with the problems of injustice which came their way. But we also learnt a great deal about the importance of integrity at the bar. I was arguing a matter before a division bench of Justice Mohota and Justice Junjunwala. I see Devansh there in the third last row, his grandfather. It was a very important case, very high stakes for a sugar factory. We had argued that judges were dead against us. I knew that they were going to be against us, and the matter was finally listed in chambers a day before Diwali. So Justice Mota turned to me and said, uh, Mr. Counsel, would you like to take your chance before some other bench? It was just a day before Diwali, now we don't, we're not really keen on proceeding with the hearing. Would you like to take your chance and go before some other bench? So I turned to them and said, uh, I said, my lords, I've, I'm totally satisfied that I have said everything that they had to be in this case. And I'm also conscious of the fact that you are dead against me on this case. But I said, I'll rest the case there Please decide as you now would like to decide. I'm conscious of which way the case is going to go. So they looked at me and said, well, it's very gracious of you to say that, but I think we'll leave this and you go before somebody else. Now we don't want to take this and keep it parted because benches break up after Diwali. So we went before another bench after the court themselves released the matter. Before the new bench, we succeeded with a full refund of tax in that case which also leads you to believe that all litigation has a certain degree of its own kundali, as, Mr. as many seniors have always told me in the, in, in the court. I had a 1966 model ambassador in those days as a young lawyer, without any air conditioning, of course. And so many of the seniors whom I used to brief, many of them are here, would be driven by me and my ambassador to maybe the Commissioner of Central Excise or to the MRTP Commission or wherever. I would take longer routes if only to have a better conversation with the senior and pick up a little thing or two, some tips on the profession. From Mr. V. M. Tarkunde, who was a very distinguished member of our bar, former judge of the Bombay High Court who came here, I briefed him once in a matter involving the Delhi hawkers. It was sheer poetry to understand the way he thought in the conference, expressed himself in the conference, understood the plight of hawkers, and he developed a whole universe which we had not even thought of when we briefed him. And that led to the judgment in Sodhan Singh versus the Municipal Corporation of Delhi. 
So I do believe that while we are as judges of the Supreme Court, we owe a great debt of gratitude to where we come from. Because can the river, can the, can the, can the rivulet, can the stream ever rise above the source? So I believe I'm just a stream coming from this great source of the Supreme Court Bar of the Indian Bar, which I have uh, greatly learned from and continue to learn every day of my life. Every day that you are a judge of the Supreme Court, you are constantly reminded of how vast the field of knowledge is. And in that sense, how much more there is to learn. Because you realize that no two cases are the same, so it's very difficult for a judge to believe that you know everything about a case or everything about a subject. Even if you have done 10 cases on the subject, there comes an 11th case which surprises you that you probably had made a very wrong assumption about the case. So I believe that much of the work which we do or all of the work which we do is a collaborative effort between the, between the bar and the bench. When I was about to become a judge of the Bombay High Court and a little, little reluctant to do that, in fact, I had walked up to Chief Justice Y.K. Sabarwal to tell him that, well, it had taken almost three years for my appointment to come. My late former wife was suffering from cancer and we didn't know which way we were going. And I told him uh, that, would you give me the liberty to now take my own freedom and leave the course of action which you have chalked for me? And he said, well, wait for a few months. But what really has been a part of my journey is this feeling of constantly being guided by others who are at the bar, of constantly being guided and shaped by others on the bench. And I think it's the same feeling which continues with me even today on the Supreme Court. I do believe that the Chief Justice of India, and for that matter any Chief Justice, even of the High Court, is what is called in Latin as primus inter pairs. Primus inter pairs, very simply put, means first amongst equals. My deep belief, watching Chief Justice in the Bombay High Court, being a Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court for almost three years, is that first and foremost, a Chief Justice is a judge. You can never forget the fact that you are a judge. And I believe that Chief Justices are either respected or they're not respected based on whether or not you do your basic function as a judge. There's an enormous amount of administrative work which you have to do as a, as, a, as a Chief Justice. And I've been constantly told over the last few days that, well, cut down on the judicial work which you do and your propensity to cross time only because you need to focus on administrative work. But I do believe that it's your judicial work which is the most fulfilling aspect of your life. And that's something which there can be no making compromises on. And that's the way I believe I, I, I intend to chart my course for the next two years. Having said that, I think it's important for me to realize that the office which I hold is an office which I hold in trust. It's an office which I hold in trust for society, for our citizens. And I do believe that each of my colleagues with whom I collaborate every day are as good or better than me. And their experiences of life are as good or better than mine. And therefore, I would be looking at my own colleagues to give me the weight of their experience. The judges of the Supreme Court who are drawn from the high courts bring to, them, to their work years and years of experience as judges, as chief justices of the high court, and their collective experience and wisdom is something which we in the Supreme Court have traditionally not tapped. And that's one of the grievances, that's one of the critiques of many of our colleagues. And I believe I have to change that and depend more on my colleagues, draw out their experiences, because that experience will contribute to strengthening the institution. <laughs> Likewise, our colleagues who have come from the bar, they have that freshness. We have become a little stale, we have become a little rusty, because even when I award costs, I award costs based on what my scale of fees was. And sometimes when I award costs, I know that lawyers smile and laugh at me, that you know, this man is completely out of sync of what fees today are, as compared to what fees were when he was a judge, when he was a lawyer. So I believe that our colleagues who come from the bar bring this freshness about the bar. They have that, in, that connect about the bar. 
Justice, Justice Nageshwar Rao had, Justice Hindu Malhotra had, Justice uh, Lalit had, and of course, Justice uh, Narsimha has. So this is this unique combination of the bar and bench which comes together in the, in the Supreme Court. We have judges who have come from the district judiciary, like Justice Bela Trivedi, Justice Bhanumati before her, who have years and years and years of experience of handling the grassroot reality of our legal system. We are people who are drawn from the bar who are elevated at a lateral point much later in our careers. But we have looked at the district judiciary. We know what the conditions are because we have worked as administrative judges in the high courts. We have traveled to remote locations. We know what the realities of our districts are. As Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court, I know that well, and we were discussing this yesterday when we were with the SCORA members, there are District courts in district court establishments in UP, when the prisoners are brought for the for the day's appearance in court, they are led by a staircase into a dungeon, but there is not even a light or a toilet, and they have to stay there the whole day. Those are the realities. As an administrative judge of Kolhapur, Justice Oak and I, we were administrative judges of Kolhapur, one of the most prosperous districts in Maharashtra. When the young women we had, a, we had a district judge who was a woman, and she told us that there is no toilet for women, judges in this district court establishment. And these young girls who are now district judge, who are judicial officers at the age of 25 and 30 and 35, they leave their home at 8.30 in the morning to come to the court, and they return home and can use a washroom only at 6 o'clock in the evening. And the district judges told us that, well, they don't go past, go to the public toilet because they have to go past the under trials who are sitting just outside the toilet and they find it extremely embarrassing to use the public toilet. So these are some of the realities of our, or some of the realities of the legal profession, of our district judiciary. And I do believe that we have to change. If we have to change, we have to change the face of the district judiciary first and foremost. I think we have fostered a culture, we have fostered a culture of subordination. We call our district judiciary as subordinate judiciary. I make the conscious effort not to call our district judges as subordinate judges, because they are not subordinate. They, are, they belong to the district judiciary. I have visited district courts where it used to be conventional, not in Maharashtra, mind you. Maharashtra is very different. It used to be very conventional for district judges to stand when high court judges are having their lunch or dinner, sometimes even try and serve the high court judges. That speaks of our colonial mindset. And I would always say that, look, we will not have our food unless you sit on the same table with us and have your food. As administrative judges, as administrative judges of the high court, you would often have District judges who would come to brief you as registrar vigilance or registrar legal, they wouldn't dare to sit in front of you as a judge of the high court. They would stand up and discuss the file with you. So we would go out of our way and say that, well, if you're not going to sit down, there'll be no discussion on the issue. Please sit in front of us, and then we'll open the file. So a great deal has to be done, not only in terms of improving the infrastructure of our district judiciary, which is extremely important, for which we have to lay the foundation blocks today, but we have to also change our mindsets about how we, as superior court judges, look at our own district judiciary, how we perceive of them. You would find that a young IAS officer does not look at a superior with a sense of inferiority. They would talk on a footing of equality, but that is not so in the judiciary. We have to ensure that when we deal with judicial officers, there are states in the country when the Chief Justice travels and crosses boundaries of districts. Judicial officer would stand in a row at the end of the boundary of one district and before the judge enters another district. All this has to change. We have to ensure that we move towards a more modern judiciary, an equal judiciary. And unless we in the superior courts, unless we in the superior courts, be it the high court or the supreme court, we realize 
that the district judiciary is really the core, it's the cornerstone of the judicial system. Nothing is going to change. And we have to inculcate the sense of self-worth in our district judiciary. Interestingly now, many more women are coming into the district judiciary. The last recruitment which took place in the state of Rajasthan, over 60% of the new recruits were women in the state of Rajasthan. I found that in the, there is, and there is a generational shift which is going on in the judiciary. There's a demographic shift which is going on in the district judiciary. When I was Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court, if you spoke to a very senior district judge, every second sentence they would look at you and say, Hanji, sir, the younger lot of judges would be talking to you on a footing of equality because that shows where India is going. The young are educated, they are bright, they have aspirations, they have a sense of self-worth, they are confident about themselves, and that's the same about our young lawyers as well. So I think when we deal with our lawyers, and that's something which I try and do in my own courtroom, I try and deal with lawyers on a footing of equality, encourage them. Sometimes we appear to be harsh by not granting an adjournment, but we do that in order to enable a young lawyer to argue a case. Sometimes we make sure that the seniors sit next to the young lawyers. So all in all, I really begin by telling you that I'm not here to do miracles. I know that the challenges are high, perhaps the expectations are also great. I'm deeply grateful to you for your sense of faith. But we, I'm not here to do miracles, but I believe that my motto every day is that if this were to be the last day of my life, have I left the world a better place? This is what I ask myself every day. There's a brilliant book by a Stanford professor, and he says, well, you can never change the way, the hand that you are dealt with by destiny, the hand in the hand of cards, a game of rummy or bridge. You cannot change the way I, the hand is dealt to you, but you can certainly change the way you play the hand. And that really is, it, it sums up what we have to do. So many demands, I wouldn't say demands, so many genuine requests from both initially Rahul and then the learned president of the SCBA. I've been in conversation with the SCBA. Uh, after that, I had a very long conversation with the members of uh, SCORA. I, was, I moved into both those meetings with a sense of trepidation on what comes next, but I was pleasantly surprised because this feeling of very great respect of camaraderie between the lawyers who met me, each one of them, feeling of great affection and camaraderie. But above all, I found that every one of your demands is so reasonable. There's no unreasonable demand coming at all. <laughs> the only question is how do you accommodate those demands? And I'm sure, I mean, with my, the collaboration of my senior colleagues, you've uh, been referring to the way in which the issue of the chambers was sorted out, the issue of security was sorted out. Uh, Justice Call dealt with the issue of security. Justice Surya Kant and Justice Gawai dealt with the issue of chambers. In fact, whenever I had a 32 petition, I would say, why are you contesting a 32 petition? Just go before Justice Surya Kant and Justice Gawai. And all those petitions were sorted out to the satisfaction of all the members of the bar. Of course, you can't please everybody all the time, but you can always try and make things easier and better for everybody. So I can only respond to all the demands which you have made by saying that every one of the demands, I mean, how can a member of the bar who has ascended to the bench regarded any, regard any of these demands as not being reasonable? And these are genuine demands which have to be dealt with step by step. We have to take each one of them in collaboration with each other. I think listing has been a real problem in our court. Justice Lalit, my distinguished predecessor, has taken very concrete steps towards making a more transparent system. I propose to continue that, build on the work which has been done very ably in a short tenure by Justice Lalit. We need to make the listing of our court transparent, objective, and perhaps my aim is to employ technology so as to remove the element of the human interface in the listing process because all discretion tends to become a discretion which is capable of being, uh, perhaps not being employed properly. 
So lawyers pointed out to me the defects, the process of verification, the process of removal of defects. We've already started working on it, and we are trying to prepare SOPs so that it should not be dependent on who is the Chief Justice. I think it's also important that we institutionalize these processes. So it should not die down when two years down the line I'll be on this podium bidding farewell to you. It must be a part of an institutional mechanism. So I believe more than just dealing with ad hoc solutions to our problems, it's more important that we institutionalize our approach to the problems which the bar faces, whether it's in terms of listing uh, or otherwise. Uh, elevation of the members of the bar. As Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court, I had the signal pleasure of having brought several judges of the High Court from the bar of the Supreme Court. I do believe that you know lawyers land up practicing in the Supreme Court sometimes as a matter of fortuitous circumstance. It's never by design. Where you are is sometimes just a product of your circumstances. Somebody comes here to study law and then you settle down here and you become a member of the Supreme Court bar. I don't think many of us can say, well, I, des I designed that I should be here as a member of the bar. Something which I can let out by way of a secret, which is that so many of us, when a young lawyer appears before us, the instinct which you have as judges who have come from the high courts is to say, is this person not good, good enough for being appointed as uh, a judge of the high court? And I have my own list of lawyers which I have in my mind. I'm sure all my colleagues have that. And I've been constantly mentioning those names to the chief justices who have preceded me. And I'm sure that uh, the Supreme Court, which has some of the best young minds in the country, would really be able to contribute very greatly to the enrichment of our high courts. So long as we balance, of course, the needs of the high court lawyers also to be uh, considered for appointment. So this is really an ongoing process which we will, uh, which we will follow. I think uh, the chief problem which we have today is of judicial vacancies. There are 25% of the posts in the district judiciary today are vacant. 30% of the sanction strength in the state judiciaries is vacant. And of course, we have a few vacancies in the Supreme Court as well. I have laid a great amount of stress on technology. That's not because I have interest in technology, because I genuinely believe that technology can be a source of inclusion. But we have to also ensure that technology does not become a source of exclusion. We are about to launch into e-filing for the Supreme Court. Now let me tell all the members of the bar that the reason why we want e-filing is not to make some you know, hi-fi uh, modern method of filing in the Supreme Court. We are conscious of the fact that everybody who is in the Supreme Court is not at the tip of the pyramid. You have among the best who earn the highest fees, but you also have the massive base, the pyramid, the base of the pyramid, where lawyers earn small fees for the purpose of their daily existence. We are conscious of that. So we are also conscious of the fact that many lawyers may not have access to a good computer or access to the internet. So one of my missions has also been to ensure that those who do not have access to technology, technology must reach out to the members of the bar, just as it must reach out to citizens. It's not the other way around. So there should be no exclusion on the ground of uh, technology. So all in all, I must tell you that this is really going to be a collaborative effort between the bar and the bench. I could go on for another hour about what plans we have in future in store. But as I said the other day, let our work do the talking and let not our speech do the talking. So I promise you that we'll work together uh, and I expect the same promise from you, that we'll expect collaboration between each other. Uh, we'll listen to each other. We'll talk to each other regularly. We'll be engaged in a dialogue with each other in the great belief and understanding that we are really part of one institution and we represent a common mission to deliver justice to our common citizens. I think I took a long time, but it's an, it's an emotional moment for me to come back to a bar fruit to which I belong. And so you'll forgive me for my uh, exceeding time. Thank you.